All right, let's go to Mark chapter 12 and verse 25. So thank you for your faith in the Lord and not forsaking the church. Amen. If everybody was like most, there wouldn't even be a local church, right? I'd have to move to Africa to preach. Treba says she's not going with me, so I don't know what I'd do. Legal separation, okay? <laughs> Let's look at verse 25 today. Let me get started, okay? When they should rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given marriage, but are as angels which are in heaven. Of course, Jesus was talking about the resurrection, and I'm not on that this morning, but what I'm going to swim over to is uh, what I really want to get to, but we're going to start here because it started here with me about the angels. And, you know, angels are, are superhuman. They're, they're supernatural. And we find a case of this uh, in 2 Kings chapter 19, Amen. So when we're raptured and changed and our people are, that are believers are resurrected out of the grave, uh, they'll be like the angels, so there'll be no more marrying and giving in marriage. And, but how are the angels like? Well, 2 Kings 19, what kind of brought this on is, uh, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but I'm getting a little older. And... Uh, I got winded the other day putting on my snowshoes. You got windy? I think, God, I'm in better shape than this. <laughs> Time I tied that rascal and then tied this one and got my coveralls on. <laughs> What's the matter with me? I'm winded. This, that's what brought this on. You know, God can use natural things to bring a supernatural insight. But an angel doesn't have to breathe. They never get winded. Amen. Amen. Well, Jesus doesn't breathe. Right. He doesn't need oxygen. But he does breathe out, and that's what I'm going to get to here this morning. Now, I can't imagine just breathing out and not breathing back in because we, we would physically die, right? Mm -hmm. Angels don't have to breathe. Now, verse 34, of 2 Kings 19, For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake for, and for my servant David's sake. It will come to pass that night that the angel of the Lord, not one angel, went out and smote the camp of the Assyrians, a hundred and forty score and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So God sent one angel with the sword, and that one angel killed a hundred and four score and five thousand. How many? How many is that in, in English here? Let's see. One hundred eighty-five thousand enemy in one night, and one mathematician deduced this thought that that angel had to kill. One person every two seconds, all night long, and never got winded. Didn't get tired. I'm glad we got a couple of good angels with us. Amen. They can take care of business when God releases them to do so. Praise the Lord. And so they're supernatural. And that's good enough. But now we will be as the angels. When we're changed. In other words, we will be able to move at the speed of thought, which is faster than the speed of light, like this angel. Zip, 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 all night long, killing 180 some thousand soldiers in one night and never had to rest. We're going to be that way. Now, I'm not saying we're going to go around and kill everybody with a sword. But there's a few in the White House I'd, I'd consider. <laughs> All right. All right. Now let's go to St. John 15. That's all I want to say about the angels. The fact is, they don't get tired. They don't have to breathe. Amen. Well, stop. They don't have any blood. Mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't have any blood. 
So how is he alive? He's alive by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's in his veins. Amen. 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 Of course, he's God too, you understand. But now as we're getting to the point here in St. John 15 and verse 16a. Do you like the A? Well, it's not in the scriptures, but we'll, we'll insert that. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Now, that's all I want to look at this morning. This is Jesus talking. He's no respecter of persons. You're here today in the house of the Lord. Amen. Settle it. You have not chosen me, Jesus said, but I have chosen you. Amen. That's the deal. Everybody say, I'm chosen. Now, when did, he, when did God choose us? Well, that's debatable. But a hint is Ephesians 1, 4. And I think uh, 20 years ago, we wrote the little jumpstart book, springboarding off of this scripture, which is circulated all over Africa now, thousands of copies. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. They need to underline that when you find it in your Bible. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The first part of this, he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. And so what the Lord is saying here is that in the infinite mind of God, apparently he knew who would received the Son, and on that basis, He could choose us in Christ before He created anything. So here again, Jesus is the subject, not us. But if you're in Christ, guess what? You are chosen, and you didn't take the first step. You simply responded to the call to be chosen. Amen. Of course, God knew who would respond and who would not respond. I trust today and I hope today every one of you souls today have made that choice to accept the calling. The calling to salvation, the calling to receive Christ as Savior and Lord and become born again a son and daughter of God Almighty. Amen. You had to make that decision like we all had to do. And it's a continual decision. We never go back on our commitment. In 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20 now, Hallelujah. 18 to 20, 1 Peter for as much as you know you were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from the vain conversation received from traditions from your fathers. Now here's how, here's how this works. But with the precious blood of Christ. Now the word Christ is the title for the Messiah, uh, the Savior. But Jesus is the name. Now, I don't like to hear people pray in thy name, O Lord. I know what they mean, but that's really not the way to pray. Huh? And people call the Savior Christ, and, and I do too, but you understand it's a title. Christ is not the name of the Savior. Christ is the title of the Savior. Christ. So actually, we receive Jesus as the Christ in order to be saved. Because His name, the name of Jesus, not the name of Christ, is what Satan must bow to. So keep that in mind, saints. When you pray, we always seal it up in Jesus' name. Not in thy name, O oh Lord, the name of... You know, get out of that religious stuff and let's get down the nitty-gritty how it really is. He said, His name. His name is Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. That's the name that we do everything 
in. In the authority of Jesus' name, everything in the kingdom of God is done in the authority of Jesus' name. Amen. I don't need to go back to the Hebrew and try to figure this out. They don't have dibs on the Greek. Amen. But I want to be nice today. Now, let's go back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, the great seed book this morning. Well, excuse me, I didn't get through with uh, verse 20. I'm sorry about that. I'm getting ahead of myself. 1 Peter 2.20, let me, let me read this. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So it's God's will to send the Savior, and when we accept Him, we're in Christ. It seems though we're already in Christ before we were even conceived in your mother's womb, before God said, light be, God knew. This is why Jesus had such a burden on him at the cross. If he would have failed, we'd all went to hell. So we owe the Lord. Every one of us, we owe the Lord. We can't repay, I know. He just wants us to live for him, that's all. Now in Genesis 2, 7, I want to get to the meat of the subject this morning. And I'm going to make a statement that's going to probably upset some people, but I kind of live that way, so that's just the way it is. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. We understand that. <clears throat> and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Everybody say, God breathed. God breathed. What did he breathe? Well, he breathed the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Spirit was used to bring life to Adam. See, we've got people walking around today that are alive but not living. Because you don't begin to live until God breathes on you. And so what happened to Adam? The Hebrew word breathe means to puff. And to blow hard. You Hebrew scholars understand this. And the word breath, look at it again. He breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. Everybody say breath. breath. All right, now that word breath is defined as wind. So, the beginning of the revelation is this, that God breathed wind into the nostrils of Adam and he became a living soul. Amen. Amen. Now in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 21. Hallelujah. How many is glad for heaven today? Exodus 14 and verse 21, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east what? wind all that night, and made the sea dry, and the waters were divided. Now in the natural, we're thinking a wind like we think about. But the reality was, it was the Holy Spirit. Right. Now, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit didn't use the natural elements, the wind, to hold back the sea. But the main point is that it was the Holy Ghost Himself that departed the waters and licked up the water and they walked across on dry land. That's another miracle there. Amen. Amen. Of course, when the Egyptians were trying to pursue the Israelites, and they all got, uh, the enemy got in the, between the, the walls of water, suddenly their chariot wheels were pulled off by the angels and they couldn't get out. And you know the rest of the story. It was a crushing experience. Now this word in, in Exodus 14, 21 
for wind is the Hebrew word yuak, which means spirit, breath, to exhale. See, we've, we've all watched the Ten Commandments on TV, great, classic, but it was much bigger than that. They got a hundred people down there struggling, and no, there was three million. It would take days to get three million people across the Red Sea with the animals and children. And of course, the women were lagging behind. <laughs> You know, it take days. All Moses had was a stick. That was it. See, we already have what we need to overcome the enemy. Already. Yes. Praise God. What I'm saying is that the Holy Spirit was the one that departed the waters and made them stand up on this side and on that side. Not the wind like we think about. Right. Even though... He could have used the wind, and I'm sure that he did. But the wind within itself would do nothing without the power of the Holy Spirit moving. That's the point. And how that happened, God breathed. You know, the frost is the blast of his nostrils. <laughs> and he has really blown his nostrils this week, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> It's all because of the corrupt election. Ding, ding. Not a coincidence. Now I want to go over to the New Testament in St. John chapter 20 now. And let's stop out at verse 21 and 22. I use this a lot because I didn't understand this scripture for many years until the Lord brought the revelation to me that no one ever preached and taught. Because traditional Christianity teaches that they were born on the day of Pentecost. Spiritually born on the day of Pentecost. And I accepted that for years. The problem is, if they were born on the day of Pentecost, how could they be filled with the Holy Ghost? Because sinners cannot receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So they had to be born again before the day of Pentecost. So I had to throw out all that Pentecostal tradition, and get down and figure out what the Word of God really said. Now I'm going to make a statement now, and I hope you can take it. I like that old country song. All in all, she took it like a man. Got to crack a joke every now and then to break the ice around here, you know. <laughs> Roger Miller had a song that was more crazy than that. Of course, I'm telling the age there. Who's Roger Miller? How many knows who Roger Miller is? Monty, I know you do. Carol, yeah, a few here that's elderly. <laughs> Somebody said, You sure are a spry to be so old. Yes, I can still run through a triple leap over the wall. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. John 20, 21. Now this is after the resurrection of Christ. Before he goes back to heaven. Before he went back to heaven. Sit on the right hand of God. Jesus said to them, Peace be unto you as the Father has sent me, I send you. The next verse says now, When he had said this, he breathed on them. I want that to soak in now. He breathed on them and said to them, Receive you the Holy Ghost. Amen. You think they did? I'm telling you. Man. He breathed on them. What did he breathe? The Holy Ghost. Amen. Same thing that God did in Genesis 2-7. Same thing that God did when the waters parted. He breathed the wind are the pneuma of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, these people that were sitting there, the disciples that Jesus breathed on, 
They were born again in a moment of time, received the Holy Spirit indwelling their life. From that point on, they were saved, born again like we understand. Amen. Yeah. But what if He had not breathed on them? Now we're going to get to something now, and you people need to think about this. Amen. So when Jesus breathed on them, He blew on them. I had a person tell me this week, well, I don't believe in being slain in the Spirit. I said, well, I guess you better tell Daniel that. Tell Ezekiel that and tell Peter that when he went up to the top of the house to pray. You found it under a trance. You better tell Saul of Tarsus that. Well, I don't believe in falling under the power of God. But well, what are you going to do when God starts standing back up? <laughs> huh? If you don't believe, you're not going to receive. What's the falling down got to do with it? Well, it's in the Bible. I explain it this way. When God breathes on you, it's a heavy thing and you can't stand up. I've even tried to pick people off the floor and they were so heavy I couldn't do it. Remember that will in Africa? Trying to pick that guy up? No way. Well, I don't believe in that. Well, if you're going to get something from God, you're going to, get, you're going to receive by the Holy Spirit. And the thing of it is, Jesus bought and paid for our blessing. It's all free. We just have to believe. Amen. You've got to be in the right place at the right time and you've got to be convinced you're the one. Of course, the good news is we're all the ones. Without exception. Glory to God. Well, what did Jesus breathe on them? He breathed the ghost. Everybody say ghost. People get spooked. Oh, ghost. Oh, you've watched too much sci-fi, people. The ghost means the spirit. Same thing. And that Hebrew, that, he, that Greek word, excuse me, is pneuma. So Jesus breathed the pneuma, or the spirit, on them. Which also means a kernel of air, spirit, breath, Christ's spirit. Amen. Now when Jesus breathes Christ's spirit on you, guess what? Something big time takes place. Amen. My concern as a preacher of the gospel, not only for myself, but for everyone that listens to me, whether here or on the camera in Africa or whatever, my big concern is why is God not breathing on some of you? That's my concern. Because if I understand this thing correctly, if God doesn't breathe on you, you're not saved. Now say, ouch or amen. It doesn't matter, people. The point is, God wants to breathe on us. And it's not a one-time deal. Amen. You can only be saved once. That song, breathe it. What's the title of that song? Mighty breath of God. There it is. Anointed song. Because it's true. Now, how many wants God to breathe on, yeah, on you? Amen. He's not going to breathe on somebody that don't want it. Right. Right. It's a terrible thing for a preacher to stand here and preach and try to get the good news through you about God's grace for you and power and love and blessings. When this person receives and the person sitting right next to that person that's receiving is dead as a doornail, that bothers me. Right. There's something wrong with your walk with God. You can't blame the church, blame the preacher. Go look in the mirror. Yes. You see, God will give us the desires of our heart. If we want God, He will get to us some way. Amen. Bypass religion, bypass people that are dead. He will find you and He will come and sit on you and breathe on you the breath of life and you'll become alive in Christ Jesus. Amen. You're talking about a revival, man. That's what a revival is. Yes. What is a revival? 
When God becomes just as real to us as He really is, that's revival. Yes. He's here today. Amen. I said He's here today. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost in my face. I don't understand it all. I just know it's real. I quit trying to understand it all years ago. I just accept the fact that God is. Not was, He is. Amen. Now, Amen. glory to God. Now in St. John chapter 3 and verse 7 and 8, to back this up a little bit, glory to God. Hallelujah. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. I mean. But the next verse, the wind blows. Ah, oh, ah. Oh. The wind. See, Jesus used natural elements to to explain a supernatural revelation. Amen. Parables are the same. He said the wind blows. They're thinking natural. Jesus is thinking supernatural. And you hear the sound thereof. But we hear the natural wind blowing through the mulberry trees. But do you know we can hear the supernatural wind of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. We can hear it. Yeah. We can feel it. Actually, it's him. <laughs> but you can't tell where it comes from or whether it goes. So is everyone that's born of the, Spirit, of the Spirit of God. So how does a person become born of the Spirit of God? That, that's the question. And if a person has been born of the Spirit of God, they're not like they used to be. God moved in, cleans up the temple, helps us to overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the power of the Holy Spirit, applying the Word of God to our lives as we grow in grace. Amen. Right. We begin to walk with the Lord and do His will, and we, we find that we're changed, not like we used to be. Old habits and sins begin to fall off, and we begin to walk in victory, and we suddenly begin to feel the wind blow on our spirit, which is the anointing of the Holy Ghost. When the anointing leads me to do certain things, it's like an outgoing to somebody. It's like the wind, but I can't see it. We walk by faith, not sight. Your heart goes out, the spirit part goes out, which is the Holy Spirit and you going out to people, going out to a person. It's the wind of God that's blowing on that person. Now there are different degrees of this. So, when Jesus was talking about being born again, he was talking about born of the Spirit or the pneuma of God. That's yes, what he was talking about. Yeah. So Jesus used the natural wind to explain the kingdom of God and how it operates. And so the last verse of Scripture this morning then, because we're going to see how much wind is going to blow today. Anybody want the wind to blow on you? I'm talking the wind of the Spirit. Yeah. How can the wind blow inside of a building? That's the reason when I'm really trying to get under the anointing to preach to you, I don't want a fan blowing. You've heard me say this 20 years. I don't want to be close to a fan. I want the door shut. Because I, if I'm going to feel the wind, I'm going to feel the wind of the Spirit, right. not from that fan. Right. You understand? I've said this 20 years. And I understand the revelation of it, but it's not fleshly, it's spiritual. Right. It'll affect our flesh, I'm telling you. Yes, we come in the church cranky and we'll leave happy. <laughs> That's okay. Just so you leave better than you came in. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. The only way we can leave worse off than we came in is the wind doesn't blow on us. You see, once you're in this thing and understand this, you've got to have God. We can't live without God. We need Him. We need the Spirit of God in the church. Yes. Moving. Operating. Through the gifts of the Spirit, so forth and so on. Amen. So Jesus used these truths to convey the revelation so that we would know. So a person is born of the pneuma of God. 
the breath of God. The same one that breathed in Adam, the same one that breathed in the disciples, breathed on us. You have not chosen me, I have chosen you. That's what Jesus said. I didn't choose when, where, how that God would breathe on me. He chose. Just like He's chose you. I said He's chosen you. Quit thinking the natural. He's chosen you. The half has not yet been told. But God's got a big, big plan. His purpose was to come and live in you big time. Yes. And where you walk as a son of God on this earth and making a difference in this sin-cursed world that we live in. Right. He's chosen you to be different. I know persecution comes along with it. So what? It's a light thing. Now in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 to 2, now let's take a look at this. This is the last scripture this morning. Short message for not preaching for two weeks, I'll tell you. But I think the Lord wants to do some preaching today. Amen. Amen. Folks, there comes a time we just got to give in. There comes a time we just got to let the Holy Spirit have control of our lives. I know this much. If there are people here today that really want God to breathe on them, He'll do it. Amen. But you can't be thinking about, you know, what happened on as the world turns and get it. You've got to clear your mind, repent of sins, this and that, and approach the throne of God boldly in the grace of God, expecting to receive exactly what you want. He already knows what you want. Really, I don't want anything. All I really want is Him. That's it. Because if I got him, everything else comes. Amen. God wants us to want him. Amen. Now in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with all one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound. From heaven as a Russian mighty wind. Yeah, now how did the wind get in the building? It wasn't the wind like we think about it at all. Yes. It was the breath of God. Wow. The wind of God. Yeah. That is multidimensional. There came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. There appeared cloven tongues like as a fire and set upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. I was talking to a person just the other day. We quoted verse 4, and I asked him, who done the speaking? He said, well, the Spirit. I said, no. They did the speaking. The Spirit told them what to speak. He goes, oh. I don't know how people can go to church their whole life and not understand these basic principles. Unless they're not teachable or they had no one to teach them. However it is, this church is different. Say amen. amen. You don't understand. You get out and about. The word level here is way up here. It's difficult to give milk because you're, you're wanting to meet some of you. Most of you. But we've got others here that's got to have the milk. So there's got to be this mixture, you see. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And so here come the wind from heaven. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. Everybody say ghost. They were filled with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Pneuma when God breathed Amen. the wind.
So they were filled with the pneuma of God. Amen. Amen. Things change when that is received, when he is received as a person. So I explain it this way. When you get saved, you receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, do you not? But when you get filled, you receive the Holy Spirit. <laughs> as a person. Because He is a person. I said the Holy Spirit is a person. The third person of the Trinity, co-equal with the Father and the Son. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have the Father and the Son. You don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have the Father and the Son. The only way to know for sure that you're saved is that God needs to breathe on you. Amen. When God breathes on a person, the wind comes upon you. What's He come upon? He comes upon your spirit that's in the body. So when Jesus breathed on the disciples, he breathed into their spirit, and their spirit was resurrected right then in a moment of time. They were born again into the body of Christ, the kingdom of God, right then. So it is today. It's a supernatural happening that takes place in the heart of a person. What do I need to do? Make yourself available? Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He'll strengthen your heart. So when the wind blows on us then, we truly have been and currently are being saved. It's not enough. If you just want to go to heaven by the skin of your teeth, one breath is sufficient. But if you want some victory and some power and anointing to black the devil's eyes, so to speak, to get some victory in your own life through the cross of Calvary by the blood of the Lamb, the Holy Spirit is key. So we are born from the breath of God. I don't know why God chose to breathe on us, but He did. Are you glad about that? What do you breathe? The Word. <laughs> so what happens then? Well, when the wind blows upon us, the fog and darkness leaves. We're enlightened. Doors begin to open then. So why would God open a door for us if we can't see where we're going? So when the wind blows upon you, Doors begin to open and things begin to change for you. Amen. Do you want him? Yes. Let's stand up today. Thank you for listening today. I tried to explain the best I could. It's just overwhelming. The question is, is this the place? It's kind of like the old, in, the old, in, the, in the Gospels there when the water began to trouble and the guy would try to get in and get, get healed and he never did make it in. But now, everyone can get in that wants in. Everyone without exception. Lord, send the wind in here today. Glory to God. Send him in. There are those today that need reassurance in their life. When the wind of the Spirit comes into your life, depression, anxiety, go. Yes. Suicidal tendencies, go. Demonic activity ceases. A change takes place. You can trade Jack Daniels for John 3.16. <laughs> Glory to God. 
Hallelujah. When God breathed on me, I burnt the marijuana 43 years ago. Haven't toked up in 43 years. But I can spot those that do. I poured the wild turkey down the drain. See, all we alkies, all we ever drank was wild turkey chased with seven up. I know none of you have ever done that, but it'll sure make you a gobble, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> what did it do? It caused nothing but heartaches. Nothing. And I was to blame. Why did God breathe on me? I don't know. Lest maybe he had a plan for me to preach a little message to you. <laughs> Today. <laughs> Is that possible? Amen. Why are you even here? I mean, logical person to stay home. It's too cold. We're not logical. Do you want the Lord to breathe on you today? All we can do is believe God for you. Let the wind will come into your soul and your heart, your inner man, and give you some peace and joy and victory again. Praise God to breathe upon you. If you've never been breathed upon, you know, you need to come down to the altar and let's say a prayer of repentance here and let's trust God. Amen. Father, I've delivered the message today, so it's up to the Holy Spirit now to do what He wants to do. Or maybe it's up to you. Maybe God's waiting on you. So here we are. We're standing here waiting to see who's going to come. 